Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to your Sunset Safari game drive here in South Africa. And it is a winter's day, but the sun is shining, so it's not too cold. Now, my name is Lauren, and on camera, I have Davi. And today, we're going to bumble on ahead and see exactly what we can find. But we need you to talk to us and ask amazing questions to us, which hopefully we can answer. And all you need to do is email them to natgeokids at wildearth.tv. And of course, we will try our very best to answer them. You can also let us know exactly what you would like to see today. It is a glorious afternoon, not a cloud in the sky, but it will get a little bit colder as the sun starts to set later on in the safari drive. But right now it is absolutely beautiful. So I have no plans for today. I'm going to try and show you as many animals, birds, all sorts of things as we can. Oh, anything that we spot for you, we will indeed put it on camera. Oh, we have a lovely bird here, hopefully. Oh, it won't fly away. Now, this is a very common bird that we have around here. It is indeed the fork-tailed drongo. And this is a very naughty bird, a very brave bird. We see it everywhere here. And it's very famous for attacking other birds, mimicking different calls. And basically, for its size, just being very brave. Well, a few people are wondering if I am going to show hyenas. I would absolutely love to show you hyenas. There's just a slight problem. I don't know where they are. But if I do find out where they are, yes, absolutely, I will show you hyenas. Of course, they are my favorite animal. And we're actually heading on to the western side of the reserve. We're sort of taking a different route than what I took this morning. So you never know, we might come across some Ah, there we go. Well spotted, Dobby. Please don't disappear. We have some dwarf mongoose here. Look at that. Hi. <laughs> That's very, very cute. And believe it or not, we were just talking about hyenas. Hyenas are actually quite closely related to mongoose. And of course, this mongoose will not be alone. The others will be hiding somewhere nearby, most likely inside of this termite mound. Now, this is a very, very small mound. Definitely would not fit anything like a hyena. But of course, for mongoose, it is absolutely perfect. They do live in a big social group. <laughs> Oh, look at its little face. So they will all live together in here. And of course, there's the alpha pair um, who are the only ones that breed. Yes, Emma's saying it looks like it's had too much coffee. Yeah, it does. Looks a bit like me. Far too. Oh, there we go. The other ones are coming to say hello. So similar to wild dogs in a respect in that there is only one breeding pair. And that is, of course, the alpha pair. So, sorry Emma, I didn't get that at all. You can, you can give it one more time though. So yes, only the top pair will breed and indeed the others in the social grouping will contribute to that breeding effort. Would a fork-tailed drongo eat a mongoose? I do not believe so. I really don't believe a bird that size. A fork-tailed drongo really is not big at all. It's actually smaller than the ring ring-necked dove that we actually always see around here. It's way smaller than a pigeon. It has a long forked tail, but other than that, it is actually a very, very small bird, and I really don't believe a fork-tailed drongo would eat a mongoose. Now, a mongoose, dwarf mongoose, was exactly what I had suspected was in the rock python's stomach that Tangana was feasting on. Whether I was right, whether I was wrong, I have no idea. Davi was, of course, wrong because he said squirrel. But this is what I suspected just by looking at the size of the bulge in the snake. But unfortunately, we actually never got any answers on that. What on earth was in the rock python's stomach? But to me, it looked the perfect size of a little dwarf mongoose. 
I think it's hiding from us now, slightly camera shy. But mongoose actually have an array of different calls and they're actually able to communicate with one another and alert one another depending on the different type of threat. So whether it's an aerial threat from a bird in the sky, or maybe a raptor, or whether it's a threat coming on the ground, they're actually able to make different calls which will warn the others where the threat is coming from. So they're very vocal and very loyal to one another within their little social family. So we're going to continue bumbling on as this mongoose is definitely hiding from us now. And they do regularly change their termite man. So we often see a little mongoose family, if you like, around one termite mound, but they do bounce between different mounds, I guess, just like the hyenas after all. So as we head forward, we are going to send you across to Steve, who also wants to say hello. In your hyena chat today, is she? So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my game drive vehicle. My name is Steve and I'm joined by Craig on camera and as Lauren talks about hyenas, that tracks absolutely everywhere. Jump on board. We found some tracks of a male leopard coming in from the south over here. Uh, someone's driven on them but they're very fresh because they've been on top of elephant tracks that were here this morning. We know that someone saw those elephants this morning and now those leopard tracks are on top of it. Now the best way to find an animal, ooh, well, you can either just bump them like these water buck over here on the right, which is normally a very, very easy way of finding animals, just bumping. Uh, stand by one, Yos. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, well, we use a radio out here so that we can talk to each other. And it sounds like somebody has gone to one of the other watering holes that we're about to go to and has found a leopard. So it sounds like Lauren is going to jump on board there quickly and go and have a look at the leopard that someone else has found. We're going to check another watering hole up ahead here called Treehouse Dam. And this over here is a small family of water buck that are never too far away from water. So I do apologize for me talking on the radio there. Someone was calling me. There's a big male. Look at those horns. Fantastic, aren't they? Well, he's going to disappear into the thickets. Oh, he goes out in the open again. You see the female without the horns. And uh, I wonder if they're a little bit jumpy because you can smell a leopard in the air. Beautiful, beautiful antelopes. They look like, they look like llamas, don't they? <laughs> so, someone still con continues to talk to me when I said, stand by one. <laughs> they are so fluffy indeed, aren't they? Look how fluffy they are. They must get very, very warm in the summer, you'd think, with those big coats. But... Uh, when you see that big ears there and that body looking in a direction, sometimes that's a good indicator that basically it might be seeing as something. But uh, it's always good to follow up. Animals will sometimes shout when they see a leopard or when they see a lion. They'll shout. Sometimes you don't hear them shout. You just see them looking. And they also do that with hyenas sometimes, because hyenas, leopards and lions all eat meat. So a lot of the animals are quite scared of them. So we need to use our animals to help us find all these other animals. So we're going to leave these warthogs, <laughs> these warthogs, these water buck, and we're going to keep going around the corner. Let's see if we can find out where this male leopard has gotten to. So Craig wanted to check the other pan earlier, and they've got a leopard there. I wonder if any of you on the dam cam have seen her. We do have people watching our dam cam, which is quite a cool thing to do. But wow, the radio's gotten very loud all of a sudden. 
Thanks very much, Yosia. Lauren's going to move in there. <laughs> He's still trying to talk to me. It's crazy. Well, I'll talk to him quickly. Oh, he's ha it's hard to talk to him if he keeps talking. Very hard. These radios are one way. So you can talk to someone, they can talk back. But if someone's pushing the button, it's impossible to talk back, unfortunately. But anyway, let's go around the corner here. we find our own leopard. Hey, Craig. Nice big male leopard. There's a... Considering where we had our two other male leopards this morning, this might even be the tracks of a male leopard that we have just recently named. We called him Molwati. So hopefully we get to find him. Jose, you want to know what leopards eat? They eat meat, Jose. They are meat eaters. They got enormous canine teeth that are designed for, for um, cutting and um, for killing and for ripping flesh. Just like dogs, cats are carnivores. All got very specially designed teeth. Ooh, we've got some very cool animals over here. Once again, I'm just gonna pull over. We've got a little family of kudu. How beautiful are those lovely ladies there, like the water buck? The male have got horns and the females do not. And there's a little baby. Now these animals, the water buck we saw, like to eat grass. And the kudu eat leaves leaves and herbs they're gonna go down to the water let's go and move around the corner here craigie maybe we'll get them drinking um so like we're coming here to check for leopards most animals have to come and drink that's why we check water holes because leopards like to actually hang out sometimes in water around watering holes so they can catch these poor little animals unawares time when you're happy craigie Good. There we go. There we go. So now, normally, kudu and your browsing animals get most of their water from the plants that they eat. But they also will drink if it becomes available. You see, it's two mamas with two babies. How beautiful are they? Such elegant antelope. See how big their ears are. That's how they keep themselves safe. They hide in the thickets and they use those very big ears to be able to hear things that are trying to sneak up on them. So you're wondering, will they maybe hang out together like this for protection? Most certainly. The thing with the kudu family is you'll often find them in the thickets. Another one is coming over the wall now. You always think you found one, and then you wait a few minutes, and then they just keep coming out. They live in small family groups, and their camouflage is unbelievable when they're standing in the thickets. When they're out in the open like this, not as camouflaged. But uh, often you will sit and wait, and you'll see one, and then two, and then suddenly you know there's five or six and you didn't even know were there. That is their strategy for survival. And so hanging out in groups is definitely the best way to survive, especially if you've got youngsters trying to keep them safe, try to hide them away. More ears, more eyes to protect yourselves and detect the movement of predators. Because although kudu are very camouflaged and have very big ears, Leopards and lions have got very similar strategies to try and sneak up on these guys. 
So it's important to hear what's going on. And they make this very loud barking sound whenever they do detect a predator. Cats, you want to know how big a kudu can get? Now, in weight-wise, a male kudu can get up to about 450 pounds, maybe 500 pounds, which is quite heavy. A female's a lot less than that. I just need to double-check, though. I want to get the math right for you. But they are actually very tall antelope. So they can, you know, 270 kilograms, the males, so that's about 540 pounds plus minus. What's she looking at there? She's sniffing. You see that one on the far left, Craigie? I wonder if we've maybe got a male leopard hiding in the thickets here that we haven't seen. And the females get about almost 100 pounds less than the males. And they stand a one and a half meters at the shoulder. Very, very big antelope. And they can jump incredibly high. They make a very loud barking sound if they see a lion or a leopard. Mm, she's a bit jumpy. Is she going to come and say hello? Coming right towards us. This is so special. You see that mane of fur on the back of her neck and the stripes and the spots. I help her to camouflage in the thickets. Help her to hide and blend in. See, there's just more and more coming. There's another three coming down and two more drinking. So the family unit just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, well, a fantastic sighting of kudu. I can't say I've seen one like this in some time. And, well, we're not the only ones out this afternoon. My good friend Trishala has managed to sort out whatever camera issues she had. She would like to say good day. Hello boys and girls, how are you? I am very well. My name is Trishala and I have Marcel on camera with me this afternoon. This is, of course, your very own live and interactive safari with us. So it's very exciting and I hope that you have lots of questions and of course some of your comments as well. So we're going to go around and look for some animals and hopefully we'll be able to find you some big cats, which would be nice. And what I'd really like to see are some elephants. I think you would also like to see some elephants. Now you can tell that I am driving into the sun at the moment or towards the sun and you know what that means? It means I am going west because the sun sets in the west and I seem to be following it this afternoon. But I'm not just following it for nothing. There's a few interesting characters that hang out around here and there's one by the name of Hukumuri and he is a leopard and there's also a female leopard and her name is Shudulu and she also hangs out in this kind of area so we're gonna go have a look maybe we'll find the evidence of them being around now there can be lots of evidence the evidence can be tracks it can be ooh, a carcass it can be a smell maybe you'll smell the elephant or you'll smell the leopard or the lion even so we're using all our senses to help find some animals Now, lions can also be in this area quite frequently. Lions like this sort of openish place where they can sit down nicely in the grass. So maybe we'll be lucky. I'd like that. I'm sure you would too. But there's somebody else who's already lucky for the afternoon and that is Lauren. So let's go over to her and her lovely leopard. I absolutely have been lucky, but I'm just going to turn this radio down. Lots of talking. You have Princess Lalam here and really someone for her money. So with me, I'm going to a better view. The block. And I'm trying to just rather than follow her. But she doesn't want to be full because so I'm going to just get a little bit in front of her. I can't see her from here, can we? 
Bear with me. You got her. There we go, Daphne's got her. She's still, she's still on the move. This is not going to be easy. There we go, Princess Tlalamba. We're going to have to keep up with her, though, I'm afraid, and it's not going to be an easy stretch at all. She's really on the move. And she's just like our mother, Tandy. She will, of course, give us the slip whenever she can. So there's another vehicle here. I'll just let them pass, I'm afraid. Hi, guys. So we're going to try and catch up with her because it's not going to be easy. And while we do that, we're going to send you across to Trish. I'm so sorry about that. I promised that Lauren did not want to look all broken up and sound broken up, and we will sort that out in a bit. But you're back with me, and we have an interesting impala here. Now, it's a male impala. You can see the horns, and that's what's telling us it's a male, and it is looking very alert. Now, we are talking about the evidence that we can use, all the clues we can use to find animals. Well, we can use other animals as clues too. See how this impala is focused on something? And the ears are twitching, moving, moving. It's trying to listen. Now, sometimes these animals can alarm call and they'll make a certain, a certain sound that will tell me that there's a predator nearby. So I've just sat here quietly and I'm just going to wait to see if there's something that's bothering this impala ram. A ram is what we call a male impala. And an ewe is the female. And there are no females around at the moment. But I'm very interested in him because he's staring into that bush. Now, if he makes an alarm call, I'm going to rush right over and see if there are some lions or even a leopard around there. And you'll notice that he's also by himself. So he's going to feel a little bit scared, a little vulnerable. Ah, some of you are wondering whether Tlalamba walked past this impala. Well, this is very, very far from where Tlalamba is. It's actually almost, so this is very close to the western boundary. Tlalamba is very central at the moment. And she's steadily moving but not close enough for him, which is why I'm interested in him. Because somebody else or something else must be around. Now, of course, he could just be looking or listening out because it's a little bit windy. Can you see the trees and the leaves dancing in the wind? So it is a bit windy. And animals, especially prey animals, they don't like it when it's very windy. They get spooked easily because they can't tell from what direction sounds are coming from. So it could just be that he wants to concentrate and listen to something. But I think it's a good idea to just watch him for a little while and see if he reacts to anything. Taylor, you'd like to know a size difference. Oh, you've turned to look at us. Hello. Size difference between uh, the Impala and the Kudu. It is uh, quite different. An Impala is only about a maximum for the males of about 65 kgs or so, maybe even slightly less than that. The females more like 40 in the region of 40 to 50 kgs and a Kudu is more in the region of about 220 kgs. So they're much, much bigger. Now you can see he's walked off. He's fairly relaxed now. He is not at all too worried. I think he, made, he might just have been listening around to, to hear if there was any potential danger, given that it is windy. And if there were, he wouldn't be able to hear very well. So he just took the time to sit tight and listen, which is always a good idea, even in the bush and even for myself. Because if you sit tight and you just listen for a little while, you might hear a leopard sawing or a lion roaring. 
and then you can know exactly where to rush off to. Now, let's keep on heading down this road. And we'll also be looking for tracks, tracks of any animals that might be coming out. Now, this is where the Impala was staring into, just off here on my right. And I see nothing and I see no tracks. I think he was definitely just trying to suss out what it's going to be like and where he's going to go to. But it seems her issues with her sound and all of that. So hopefully you can have a good glimpse of Talamba. I'm not sure Lauren has any leopard at this rate, I'm afraid. Lamba is not making it easy for any of us here. There is some other vehicles following her as well. I'm just trying to keep distance here. She's on the move rapidly. There's no way, I don't think, we can give you any visual of her from here. She's right in front of this vehicle up ahead. So it's going to be bashing about a little bit until she finally decides to sit perfectly on the top of the termite mound just as the sun is going down and give us a glorious look at her. Really not sure that's going to happen, but we're going to keep trying to follow her. It's been a while since I personally have spent time with Klalamba. Um, it's just not going to be easy at the minute. We keep getting glimpses of her and then of course our glimpses are either blocked or she keeps on a moving. So at the minute we can't go anywhere. I'm afraid we have two vehicles up ahead. There's other people in the sighting and they have blocked our path and Tlalamba is on the move. Yes, Michelle, 100%. She is just like her mother. <laughs> I thought Hukamuri was bad following through the thicket, but this one, and actually the grass around here is longer than her herself. So she's a very short, slender leopard and it's just not easy at all to actually see her. There we go, you can... No. I can't even make her out there. Can you see her? No. Unfortunately, we have absolutely no visual to give you. Let's just all hope she sits down <laughs> beautifully for us all, so at least we can get to spend some time with her. So back over to Trish as we try and catch up with the little naughty princess. Ah, Salamba can be a bit like her mum handy and can give you the slip but I found something here now I wanted to stop and show it to you even though it's not particularly fresh fresh because I think these are from last night because we had lions last night now if you look here sweep can we see it that there's a lion track now it's not particularly big can you see it's just maybe a little tinier than my hand and you can see distinct three lobes, one, two, three, just on the back pad there, and you've got these four fingers. Now, this looks like a female lion track. You can see that this part here at the bottom, which is your palm, it doesn't extend out, and if it did, well, it usually does for a male. So this looks like a female lion, or lioness walking up this road. So you know that when we have tracks, all animals leave tracks when they walk on things like this, even us. If I had to put my hand down there, even I would have a track. It's not the clearest one. There we go. Even I would have a track. And if I took a step, I would have a track too. And you would know that I was there. So that's what the animal's track is telling us. It's telling us where they are and what direction they're moving in. And sometimes it can even tell us how long ago it had happened. If conditions are just right and you are lucky, you can get a very, very accurate sort of description of where the animal has gone, just from that track. But like I said, these are older tracks. So we're not gonna be following them, but we're still hopeful because the lions were here yesterday 
or last night, but they can move quite a bit. So we're going to just try around this area and see if maybe we can find some, which would be awesome because I love to spend some time with lions, especially our big male lions called the Evoca males. They are very, very, very handsome. <laughs> Mrs. Anna, you'd like me to please have a stern chat with the Evokas and just ask them what on earth is happening? Where are they cubs? Can you please bring them out? I will try my hardest. I will try my hardest to let them know that they need to share and we need to see those cubs. Strangely, you know, you say that and today, I don't know why, I just had this, this not a vision, but image of, of the cubs. I was thinking about them and I just imagine seeing them in infrared. So that means in the evening sometime, <laughs> if we go according to what I see in my head as just random thoughts really. But I can just imagine them. Ooh, Lauren has finally caught up with Lalamba. Let's go to her. I think there was a little bit of miscommunication between myself and Emma there. Um, she's still on the move, still through the grass, and we still have no visual. <laughs> We had a fish. Okay, I'm sorry. The sun is like absolutely in my eyes here. And we do have vehicles up ahead of us. So until we're just going to have to keep following her. She's really on a mission. I wonder what she is up to. I'm really hoping for that moment that she actually stays stationary. At the minute, I can't see her at all. One for the sun and two for the vehicles. But we're going to keep following. I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to let the vehicles get a little bit in front. And then we will continue bundabashing through the bush after this leopard. Oh, I'm in reverse. That's not good at all, is it? We need to be in the forward gears. Abby, can you see her? No, I don't have any visual for her at all. Yes. The sun is blinding. Okay, I'm afraid this is going to be a bit of a mission again. And while we try to do that, we are going to send you across to Steve, who is on a mission. There we are, always on a mission. Just bumbling along now. We found those tracks again. Not sure if it's the same leopard, but it is a male leopard. And the tracks came away from that watering hole. And it seemed as if the animal was hunting. It was running and turning and left and right. So we're just doing another little turn around the block here. Uh, every now and again, we switch off. Sorry, Craig, did I get you in the... I just got Craig in the face with a branch. Sorry, Craig. Every now and again, you switch off and just listen. We put our kudu ears on. Ooh, I hear a helicopter. And we listen for birds and animals like Impala and Kudu who might shout if they see this male leopard. Because if he's hunting, it means he's moving. And if he's moving, there's a chance that the animals will see him. There's also a chance we might. Oh, oh. Oh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> it doesn't sound good at all. So we'll just keep going along here. And then I am going to go to my watering hole. Chitwa, which I discussed earlier. I'm just on our boundary now. So I'm kind of getting off the property because there are three of us out. So I am allowed to be here at the moment, which is okay. We might be lucky with a leopard. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It'd be wonderful if we find a leopard for you on this lovely Saturday afternoon. Just scanning. You can imagine trying to see a leopard in this thickets as it's moving. 
If it's not moving, it'd be very, very hard to do. Indeed, this is much peaceful, much more peaceful than Columbus craziness. I followed her last week, Friday, and uh, she really made me work. Made me work indeed. Up and down, she's on a mission, Tlalamba. The little playful one is always on a mission. My arms were actually sore last week from driving after her. So maybe we'll find this male leopard I've been talking about who's called Molwati. He's a, a leopard who's kind of sort of new to the area. He only got a name yesterday. It was a very cool name. And he's not the most relaxed cat. So if we do see him, we've got to be very quiet. Switch off the car. Don't move too much. Slowly over time, he'll get more and more relaxed. But I honestly can't tell you from the tracks if it is him or not. Tracks are tracks. It's a male leopard. That's all I can tell you. He's somewhere in this block. And it is a almost insurmountable task to see one. So you're wondering how we habituate animals. So habituation kind of works out that you see one far off and you switch off. You go quiet. And then it's, it kind of looks at you, goes, OK, you're not a threat. And then you, you move a little bit, you talk a little bit, and then start the car. See if, as soon as it reacts, you switch off the car again. And you slowly do this and do this until eventually you're able to drive quite close to the animal. It's not something that happens overnight, especially with adults. Adults, it takes a little bit more time, but they realize that you're not affecting them in any way. You're not hitting them. You're not stealing their food. You're not chasing them in any way. Um, and eventually they start getting relaxed. It's, it's much easier with leopards if uh, they've got a, some food, a kill that you can come to. They want to go to the kill, so you can, you can spend some time there. But from a far distance away, you slowly, slowly, incrementally get closer and closer. But the easiest way to habituate animals is if mum is habituated, then the cubs, they relax very quickly to the vehicle. And we've got some very relaxed leopards in this area. And this Mulawati is a big male who's come from we don't know where. He's dispersed from probably somewhere in the Kruger Park where no one's ever really been able to follow him. But I would like to spend some more time with him. And I've seen him a few times now, uh, but he always moves away. He's a little bit more relaxed after dark and with one vehicle. I had him like that last year, end of last year. As soon as another vehicle came along, he ran away. It's just that extra noise and extra disturbance that they get a bit worried and they move off. But habituation can take a week, two weeks. It can be that quick. Hello, Ian. You know how we tell the difference between male and female tracks? Well, oh, we're almost at the junction. Okay, there's some old female tracks there. We're almost at the junction. Ooh, I found a lovely feather. Sorry, Ian, I'm going to get back to your question now. But um, this is a feather for my cap. This is a marvelous lilac breast. Ooh, ooh, that lilac breasted roller was killed here. Here's his feather. How gorgeous is that? There's some more feathers on the ground here. So I think one of these guys got caught and eaten. Shame. How beautiful is that feather? They're coming out nicely in the light. Yeah. So, Ian, you want to know the difference between a male and female track? Um, essentially, the female track is slightly smaller and narrower than the male's track. And the female, the male's track is about 10 centimeters. The female's track is about eight, maybe nine centimeters. So down on the corner here, we've done a big loop. I'll show you a male leopard track. And then we'll compare it to a female. And it's just a little bit bigger. Um, you can get confused. It does take a bit of practice. Sometimes I also just take out my knife and measure it just to make sure. Centimeter and a half is, is a lot. 
There's a lot, really, for tracks. And that's it. It's as simple as that, really. But the male, his toes also a bit wider on the side. They actually come out a bit wider. They're a bit bigger on the shoulder. Their head is a bit bigger, a little bit more muscle. So their front feet need to be a little bit bigger. It's the same as Kudu we saw before. The male's tracks are much bigger than the female's because he's got much bigger shoulders and a bigger head. This bigger head with horns as well. So he needs sort of the footing underneath him to have much bigger feet. Just like most people, guys' feet are bigger than girls, aren't they? For the most part. So here is the little junction. See if I can find that track for you. I actually... Okay, well, while I try and find the tracks I wanted to show you, it sounds like Columbus found something she'd like to snack on. So let's quickly go over to her. I am going to have the biggest biceps in camp by the end of this. Columba is bounding and leaping, literally. Oh, Daddy's got a good job. Bounding and leaping over logs, bouncing off trees like a ninja, and just all over the place. Hey, girl. Why are you being naughty? It is so good to catch up with her again, especially since I was talking about her this morning, since... I really believe. Oh, what is she doing? Has she got something? It really looked like she was after something. No, I don't think so. Oh! She is full of beans, let's just say it this way. Full of beans. Obviously hungry, alert, full of energy and just bounding and leaping around. With the minute she sits still, Emma tries to come to us and she leaps away again. What a challenge. Okay, I think I can go forward a little bit. What do you think? Yeah. Hank is asking how fast can a leopard run? Well, they can reach speeds of up to 75 kilometers per hour, between 65 and 75, and they get faster than lions. Okay, we're just gonna go a little bit more forward. Can you get it from here? Yep. They're much faster than lions because they're less bulkier, but of course they're not as fast as the cheetah. So they can reach about 75 kilometers per hour and they cannot sustain it for very long. So they're obviously stalkers. They are obviously very agile. Talamba's showing us right now exactly how agile she is. And of course they climb trees, so they are able to move in such a range of motions. However, they can't sustain running for very long. They normally wait till their prey is right in front of them before they make the kill. So they will use all of that energy in a big burst of speed. But then of course they will run out of energy at some point. They're not built for long distance running like the cheetah. They are far more muscular and heavier, much more heavier than the cheetah, weighed down by heavy shoulder blades, weighed down by muscle, a larger skull, larger larger teeth and of course they just can't sustain the running for too long. <sighs> Thank you for sitting still for a few minutes. She's <laughs> obviously having a little groom. I felt like she grabbed something there but I can't possibly think what it might be. Adorable little lady and I've, I say this regularly every time I find Clalamba she's in this block I really don't think she moves too far now of course rapper, leopards roam at night time but I feel little Clalamba here has got her habits she's got the areas that she likes to hang out in and this is the block I find her in every single time hey beautiful Oh, that's perfect. Now we can't see you because of the log. Okay, let me try and reverse just marginally so we can at least get a look at our face. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Okay, there we go. Oh, lots of people are saying well done, thank you. Davy actually got injured on his finger by a thorn and he's now very unhappy with me. 
is really not happy at all. He got a little thorn prick, so we're full of injuries on this vehicle. It's genuinely not easy keeping up with a cat while trying to maintain her in your visual sight and your visual field at all times. You want to know where she is because you also want to maintain distance. I'm a big believer in keeping distance as much as you can from the animal. And if you can go around them, it's better to go around them than, of course, chase them from behind. I mean, sometimes you have no option if the animal is walking along the road and there's really thick vegetation on either side. But I prefer to try and go around the animals so that they can at least see you. They obviously have binocular vision, so they aren't really the same as us. They aren't really able to see much past the side. So you don't really want to give them a fright and creep. keep creep up on them. So I try to bear this in mind when following a leopard and of course when there is other vehicles at the sighting as well. It makes it even more delightful. And that was sarcasm in case anyone couldn't tell. But at least she's laid down for now. Ivy's saying what makes her really naughty. Oh, of course she's not naughty. I just think she's full of beans. I think she's got a lot of character, just like Hosanna, actually. Every time I see this girl, she's on a mission. She's bounding and leaping and driving off some... Driving, I don't know where I said driving. Alrighty, there is another vehicle coming. That's probably why I said driving. So I think the others are actually leaving. Just let me figure out what's going on here. Yes, we've got one vehicle pulling out, so we may have to pull out soon, I'm afraid. But I think for now we're okay. So yeah, she's not actually really naughty. I just think she's full of beans and incredibly difficult to catch up with. Normally when you're driving beside Hosanna or Tingana, they're pretty easy to keep up with. They really like to walk along the roads. They tend to walk quite slowly. But Kalamba is just like her mother. She's very slender, much shorter, and she can easily slip into the thicket. So I'm just going to check the vehicle situation here. And while we do that, we're going to send you across to Trishala. I am always full of beans. Very seldom am I not. Uh, Marcel snickered at the back of the... What was that, Marcel? Oh, it was a laugh of agreement is what he says. Okay. Well, full of beans is... Oh, hello, Warty. It's going to come up on our left now. So let's say hello to this warthog. If he hasn't rushed off. Oh, there he is. Oh, and he's got little ones with him. So... Oh, this is so cute. So you can see him with the big tusks. That's our male on the, on the right. And now this one on the left... I can't tell just list, but I think that that is mum and the little ones. Hello, you. These are, of course, warthogs. And you can see that the tiny ones are also around with mum getting something to eat. Now, if you look at how these tiny ones are eating... Can we see them? There they go. Look at how they bend down. So they'll put their butt in the air and they'll put their front legs down and then they go close to the ground to try and eat. Now they use their nose like most pigs. Oh, you all walked off. It's fine. We'll keep on going. Oh, I think they're going to come up in front of us. Let's see. Let's see. Now I was saying they use their noses like shovels and make it big like this and they shovel sand. Rosemary, you say it's family night. <laughs> it certainly is family night. And we have some warthogs that are bolting through now. All these little ones with their wonderful mohawk style main there. Isn't that sweet? Let's make sure all little ones have crossed. All little ones, have you crossed? They have. Okay, so I am very close to an area where there are other little animals sleeping, other little creatures. Hopefully they'll be around. We're going to have a look and they are called hyenas. And uh, we are right near the den, so we're going to pop in there. 
fact, it's just opposite here. And we'll also be able to find our mongoose family and see if they are back in their mound for the last bit of sun that they can catch. Let's have a look. Now, I love driving this little road here because I feel like it offers me so much potential. Hmm. Looking for tracks. Now this, this road actually leads all the way down to a water source. So you'll find that lots of animals use this track to walk down. So that's why I say when I would drive down here, I feel like it has so much potential. And I know I'm going to pass the mongooses on my right. And I know I'm going to go to the hyena den. So there's lots of potential when we drive through here. Let's see our mongoose friends. Are you here? Well, this is their house just here. Oh, let's have a look at where they live. So, out here is where they live in this mound. And they are not around at the moment. But usually in the day, they'll come out and they'll sit at the front and try to absorb as much sunlight as they can. Anyway, they're clearly not home. So, let us move on. We'll go down to the hyena den. And while I do that, let me send you to Lauren with that leopard. Talking of mongoose, she did kill something. I sh thought she did. She absolutely leaped and bounded into the air and almost ninja kicked something. And I thought she killed something and she did. She just had it in her mouth and from a distance it looked like a mongoose. I honestly can't tell you what it is and she seems to be finished already and already on the move. Crikey bobbins girl, how can we keep up with you? It looks like we're going to have to, but she did have a tiny, tiny mini kill there. Oh, she's sitting down having a scratch. <laughs> and back on the move again. That scratch didn't last very long. Okay, I am going to reverse once I know that she's safely out of my line of sight. She's crossing over to the other side. Of course she is. What a character. Let's see if we can give you a view from here before we start going backwards and chasing her. Classic to Lamba. Yes, I agree with many of you. So this is going to be another mission, maybe one that I am not sure. She's going really thick into the dense vegetation there. Bavi's going to give you a view. Really, really thick. I'm not 100% sure it's going to be possible to bash through here. But I shall give it a try. Anna's saying she wonder if she stays here because it is so thick and quite a challenge to get through. Yes, do you know what? Most likely it is. She likes putting us through our paces, that's for sure. Okay, I'm gonna loop around. She's over there, I can see her. Let's see if we can try and get any closer to her. But yes, she probably loves it here. It's thick. She just caught a little snack. I've no idea what it was. It looked like a mongoose. Trees. You are somewhere in here, princess. Huh? Is she just giving us a clumber slip? Can you see her? Nope. Oh my goodness. Okay, I might move forward. We're going to pop out on a road here, and that would be absolutely ideal if she also popped on, out onto the road. Alrighty, so the Mission Impossible continues. As we power on, we're going to send you back across to Steve. Well, we're finally going into Chitwa, and um, good luck there, Lauren. Tlalamba does not like to follow the roads anymore. She is a bush bundu bashing girl, and she loves to just walk straight 
through the thickets. My arms, I think, are still feeling it from last week. And that was in the darkness with the spotlight and everything. Whew. Really made me work. Anyway, we've just come down to Chitra. This is one of the largest watering holes in this area that we have access to. And I just called on the radio to see if anything's going on, but our communications, unfortunately, this side is not that good. I didn't hear anything, but we're just going to sort of roll down to the water, and who knows what we might find there. Okay, so that's Peter. There are some impalas shouting on the other side there, close to the airstrip. And impalas shouting often means a leopard. So we'll get down past the watering hole and see if maybe we can give Peter a hand, following up on whatever cat might be. Lovely. Lovely afternoon. Okay, so now he's just told me that um, they're actually shouting at the hyena. As I said before, sometimes they shout at hyenas. I, I've never really seen it, but I know they do do it. And uh, on the other side by the airstrip, he's just said that the impalas are shouting at the, at the hyena. The hyena's a similar sort of size to leopard and it sort of moves through the grass, same sort of way. I've even had uh, them shouting at small antelopes because, well, they see a movement, they go, what's that, what's that? <laughs> well, actually, all it is is just a small antelope trying to walk around and do his thing. But when you get eaten out here by absolutely everything, it pays to be vigilant. It pays to be vigilant, otherwise you don't survive the night. Those bold impalas who, don't, uh, who aren't vigilant, they don't have any babies. So impala have learned to be very, very vigilant. Well, we do have a predator on the ground there called an African fish eagle. Just going to sidle up to him over here. And we got him, Craigie. There's the fish eagle on the ground. Kayla, probably one of the most common birds that we find around here are, in fact, the Egyptian geese that we find around this watering hole. They're very, very common, Egyptian geese. Um, but, but then, actually, the most common bird is the red-billed quelia, which are very, very small seed-eating birds, and they accumulate in very, very large flocks, hundreds of thousands of birds at the same time. Um, we don't see too many of them here, but they are the most abundant bird that frequents sort of this savannah type ecosystem and here is a little picture of it you're looking at the fish eagle there that is one of the most common raptors here is the red-billed quelia with his breeding plumage isn't that pretty very very pretty and they feed on seeds whereas the fish eagle down there they feed on fish and meat fish and meat and let's have one more look at him you might even see he might be feeding on something or just drinking, keeping his feet nice and wet. Well, this is Chitwa, where we have birds and we have hippos. And it is a lovely afternoon. Many people will park here on the water's edge. I have a bit of a sundowner. It's one of the common things to do on safari. A little bit of an apple juice or a cool drink. Some snacks while you listen to the bush quieten down around you. Well, boys and girls, that brings us to the end of another National Geographic Kids show. We hope you've enjoyed your drive with us this afternoon. Uh, we were able to get Tlalamba for you, some water bucks, warthogs and kudu and finishing off with a wonderful fish eagle. Thank you for your questions and comments. We'll see you same time next week. Have a beautiful week and a beautiful day further.